Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Cross Giver, the director of scholarly programs here at the library. And my function is very simple. I simply want to tell you how we're going to proceed. Uh, this session is being cybercast live, so that if you want to tell your friends later, it will be on the library's website for later viewing. We will archive it on our website. The procedure is as follows. I will introduce the librarian who will introduce our speakers, Sariadim. Professor Bernard Lewis will speak first. Professor Mohammed Arkun will speak second. After Professor Arkun has spoken, they will both sit at the table here and be prepared to take questions. We are going to take written questions, and there will be cards which you can write your question on, and they will come to me, and I will uh, ask the questions to our speakers. And that way, we won't get a lot of reiterative questions on the same subject. So, I'm delighted you're all here, and we will now proceed. So I will give you the Librarian of Congress, James Bullock. Good evening and welcome. It is a great pleasure to welcome here our distinguished ambassadors, members of Congress, others, distinguished guests. Tonight we have a really unusual privilege, I think, of hearing two distinguished professors who devoted their careers to the explanation of Islam from very different backgrounds and perspectives. The need, of course, to understand Islam has uh, gained urgency and a great deal more attention since tragic events of September 11th. Both of our speakers this evening have, however, for many years taken a long historical perspective, and it is to those deeper historical and cultural foundations for the study of Islam that our discussion this evening will address. The program this evening builds upon the library's efforts over the past two years to create discussions and research on fundamental issues um, dealing with the Islamic world. For many decades, the library has collected actively from its field offices in Jakarta, New Delhi, Islamabad, Cairo, and Nairobi, materials originating in Muslim countries, in Arabic and in many other indigenous languages. Uh, since March 2000, 10 symposia have been held here on the general subject of globalization and Muslim societies, half of which have been filmed and are available for viewing on the library's website. Beginning on July of this year, Rockefeller Foundation will make possible several postdoctoral research fellowships in Islamic studies and with the advice of Professor Arkun, we're in the process of creating a sustained Islamic studies program with a long-term research agenda that will make full use of the really extraordinary resources here in the nation's library. It's now my pleasure to get out of the way and introduce our two distinguished speakers. I'll, I'll introduce them both now, and then they will come up sequentially without further appearances of the non-expert you now see before you. Professor Bernard Lewis is the Cleveland F. Dodge Professor of Near Eastern Studies Emeritus at Princeton University. He was born in London, educated at the University of London, primarily School of Oriental and African Studies and History, and at the University of Paris. In 1938, Professor Lewis began teaching at the University of London, and in 1974, moved across the Atlantic to Princeton University. His main research interests have been in the history of the Ottoman Empire and of modern Turkey and the relationship between Europe and the Middle East. He's the author of an astonishing more than two dozen books. Among his most recent, Islam and the West, The Middle East, A Brief History of the Last 2,000 Years, The Multiple Identities uh, of the Middle East, and of the one from which we have drawn part of the title for this evening's discussion, um, What Went Wrong, uh, Western Impact, and Middle Eastern Response. We are pleased that uh, Professor Lewis is able to begin our program this evening, and he will then be followed by Professor Mohammed Arkun, who was born in Algeria, 
received his doctorate from the Sorbonne in 1969, served as professor of the history of Islamic thought at the Sorbonne from 1962 to 92, and is now professor emeritus at the Sorbonne and director of Arabica, Journal of Arabic and Islamic Studies. Dr. Arkun has been visiting professor at many universities in Europe, the Middle East, and the United States. He's been widely recognized for his contributions to the scholarship on Islam and will receive next week a major prize at UCLA for his work. Professor Arkun is the author of many books, most recently, The Unthought and Contemporary Islamic Thought. Earlier books <coughs> include uh, L'Humanism Arabe, La Pensée Arabe, trans which has been translated into Arabic, English, Italian, Spanish, Swedish, and uh, lec uh, lectures on the Koran, and Islam um, Approche Critique. Um, which has been translated in English as Rethinking Islam, Common Questions, Uncommon Answers. All of these books have been uh, uh, in multiple editions. He's been a stimulating presence on several occasions um, uh, as a visiting uh, scholar here at the Library of Congress and has <coughs> lectured almost everywhere in the Islamic world from Jakarta to Morocco. So we are pleased that he is also uh, able to participate in this evening's discussion. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I would just say of both of our speakers today that they have not only uh, plumbed the deeper levels of scholarship, but they have also been uniquely effective in communicating with broader audiences without ever losing the depth and perspective of long-term scholarship. So it's a great pleasure to introduce these two speakers who, as I say, will speak without further interruption from me, and it's my pleasure and honor first to introduce and turn the podium over to Professor Bernard Lewis. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. First, uh, is this working all right? I found by experience it's well to make sure before I get started. Um, let me begin with a word of explanation. The title of my book, part of which is the title of our discussion this evening, What Went Wrong? <clears throat> um, in case, let me at once remove any possible misapprehension that might arise about what the title meant and the book is about. This book, with this title, was already in page proof um, before September the 11th. It is not, therefore, an attempt to discuss the events of that day, nor the consequences that followed them. It may, however, I think, serve some purpose in helping to elucidate the circumstances that led to those events. What went wrong is a question which has been asked now <clears throat> with increasing concern one may even say with increasing agony all over the Muslim world. And this may come as a surprise to you. One can date it with some precision for slightly more than 300 years. What matters is in the human disc perception and discussion of such problems is not when things happened, but when they were perceived to have happened or to be happening. <clears throat> <clears throat> In our histories, we usually refer to a certain period as the Middle Ages, meaning a, a sort of interval between the decline of ancient civilization, meaning Greece and Rome, and the rise of modern civilization, meaning ourselves. <clears throat> An interval when nothing important happened. We see the last stages of antiquity and the first stages of modernity. We sometimes even call it uh, the Dark Ages, at least part of it. This is a very parochial European perception. Because during that period, 
There was another part of the world where a very high and advanced civilization was flourishing, which is the true intermediate stage between antiquity and modernity. If we want to trace a succession from ancient to modern civilization, it would go not through Europe, but through the Islamic world, where between antiquity and modernity, a civilization was developed, which in every significant respect was by far the most advanced, the most open, the most flourishing, the most wealthy and the most powerful that the world had yet seen. <clears throat> it had one very important new feature about it, its universality. Until then, there had been many civilizations in the world, but all of them were in a sense local, or if you like, regional, and for the most part limited to one ethnic group. That was the case of the ancient civilizations of India, of China, of ancient Egypt and Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome. And although Christianity was in principle universalistic with a message for all humanity, nevertheless, in what in Europe was rightly called the Middle Ages, it was really a local civilization, one region, not a very large one, one ethnic group. Um, in contrast to that, the civilization of Islam was international, one might even say intercontinental, bringing many different cultures, many different traditions, many different groups, and extending from the Atlantic shores, from Morocco, even Spain for a while, parts of France and Italy, going eastwards as far as India and China, a vast area. This civilization was certainly the most advanced that the world had yet known until that time in virtually every significant field of human endeavor. If we begin with the most obvious military power, it was vastly more powerful with far greater conquests and achievements than any of its predecessors. If we look at the economic side, it produced a developed and sophisticated economy with banking and credit and other things on which we are accustomed to pride ourselves, but in which medieval Islam was our predecessor. In the sciences, mathematics, physics, chemistry, virtually any other science that you may choose to mention, they were in the forefront of human achievement, building on the inheritance of antiquity, both Hellenistic and Middle Eastern, incorporating other elements from further east, from India, from China, and adding to it enormously by their own efforts, particularly through experimentation, a form of scientific investigation which the ancients did not practice. It was also in many ways the most tolerant, the most open, admitting different groups and granting a limited but nevertheless effective tolerance even to those who differed from them in the most basic of all things, religious beliefs. <clears throat> and then things went wrong. Now, if you look at it in a global and historical perspective, you would have to say that the change was a very gradual one. Some loss of territory in the far west, Spain, Portugal, Sicily. Um, some encroachments from former colonial subjects now invading the territories of their former masters, the Russians invading the lands of the Tatars whom they had chased out of Russia, the Portuguese sailing around Africa to East Asia and so on. But all this was seen as remote and peripheral. As I say, in a global historical perspective, it was a gradual process. But people do not normally see things in a global historical perspective. In America, not even now, with all the modern media at our disposal, how should we expect it in the days before printing and television? What created the awareness that something had gone badly wrong was a quite specific sequence of events. Remember that in the 17th century, Islam was still a powerful force advancing into Europe. The Ottoman Empire, the last, most enduring, and in many ways the most powerful of all the Islamic empires, had conquered the Christian city of Constantinople and was advancing into the heart of Europe, twice as far as Vienna. 
<clears throat> Europe was under threat. Turkish Pashas were ruling in Budapest and Belgrade. Corsairs from North Africa were even raiding the Atlantic coasts in the north <clears throat> in search of human booty. And then suddenly the change. The second Turkish siege of Vienna, the first was inconclusive. The second Turkish siege of Vienna was a shattering defeat. The Turkish historian of the time, Sultan Mehmet Ağa, uses a striking phrase to describe it. He says, this is the most calamitous defeat that we have suffered since the foundation of the Ottoman state. I often find myself wishing that present day historians in the Middle East could achieve equal candor. It was indeed a shattering defeat, a headlong rout through the Balkans, ending with a treaty, a peace treaty, the Treaty of Karlovitz of 1699, which is distinctive in that it was the first peace treaty dictated to a defeated Ottoman state by victorious Christian enemies. This was a change of unmistakable significance and dimensions. And the debate began almost immediately afterwards. The peace was signed in 1699. From 1700 onwards, we find in Turkish records, in Turkish writings, uh, other than records, an anxious discussion. What went wrong? Beginning specifically with the military question, the lessons of history are most perspicuously taught in the battlefield. In other areas of instruction, it takes longer and more sophistication. The lessons of the battlefield were clear. And it is with that that the debate begins. They ask, why is it that in the past we always conquered the infidels, now the infidels conquer us? Why is it that in the past we added province after province to our empire. Now we are losing province after province to the infidels. The previous expectation was an uninterrupted continuation of victory until all the world was absorbed. Uh, for example, the earliest Muslim account of the discovery of the new world is a book written in Turkey in the mid 16th century. And it describes the new world from obviously European sources and ends by saying, by expressing the pious hope that in God's good time, these lands would be illuminated by the light of Islam and added to the realms of his majesty, the Sultan. This was not a formula. This was a confident expectation at that time, which made the, the shock of Vienna and Karlovitz even greater. The debate began, as I said, in the Ottoman elite, the political, military, administrative, intellectual elite. But in the course of time, it spread far beyond that, first to other elements in Turkey, and then from Turkey to other countries, as defeat was followed by defeat. <clears throat> For many centuries, it, Muslims have threatened Europe. Three times they had seemed within sight of conquering Europe, the Moors in Spain, the Tatars in Russia, the Turks advancing on Vienna. In all three, they were defeated. And now, worse was happening. Their former subjects were pursuing them. The Spaniards and the Portuguese went sailing after their former masters. The Spaniards went west, but the Portuguese went east. The, Ta the Russians, having driven the Tatars out of Russia, followed the Tatars into Tartary. And with the defeat of the Ottomans, the last great Muslim power seemed to be eliminated. And the European counterattack, which in Spanish history is called the Reconquista, and in a larger scale is known as the expansion of Western imperialism, took place. Um, Muslims in Turkey and then in other countries could not but be painfully aware of this change. They were also becoming more and more painfully aware of other accompanying changes. For example, in the economic field. <clears throat> and this, at this point, we begin to get involved in the second part of the title. Why? Why was this change taking place? Why was this rich, strong, enlightened society falling behind? A number of explanations were offered in the course of the centuries. 
The original inquiry, as you would expect, was military. The first defeat was in the battlefield, and the remedy, it seemed, was to modernize their armies, that's to say, to adopt the more effective, more successful weaponry, strategy, and methods of the European armies. And this goes beyond purely military matters. <clears throat> we find the reforming Ottoman sultans not only adopting Western weaponry, but also dressing their troops in Western-style uniforms with tight-fitting tunics and slacks and belts, obviously much less satisfactory and less suitable than the traditional uh, garb, but these having the, the prestige of victory. Uh, Sultan Mahmoud II sought advice all round. He got the Prussians to advise him on his army. He got the French to advise him on his bureaucracy. He got the English to advise him on his navy. And he even decided that he would have a brass band. And he asked the Sardinian embassy to send him a bandmaster. And in due course, a bandmaster arrived. His name was Donizetti, uh, a brother of the famous composer, who later, he stayed the rest of his life in Turkey. He was commissioned in the Ottoman army, which was necessary for a bandmaster. He later became a brigadier and a pasha. And the last we hear of him is conducting an orchestra of harem ladies escorted by eunuchs to the entertainment of the sultan. However, that is a digression. <clears throat> <laughs> the military explanation and the military remedies were obviously not working. They modernized, they westernized, they imported new weapons, they brought in Western advisors, and all they got was defeat after defeat, an occasional rally. But there was no doubt that in the last 300 years, the tide of battle had turned decisively in favor of the Europeans and against the Muslims. So they looked for other explanations. One was the economy. And some discovered this curious Western practice building things called factories, which turned out goods and commodities more cheaply, more efficiently, and more rapidly than traditional methods. So decrees were issued and governments set up factories, which unsurprisingly were not a great economic success. There were some who were, shall we say, a little more sophisticated. They looked at the West. By now, Muslims were beginning to visit the West. Previously, there were very, very few Muslims who traveled in the Christian lands. Ambassadors and prisoners of war, and that's about all. Um, now there were more, and even from the early 19th century, students being sent by their governments to study in Western universities, and more particularly in Western military colleges. And they discovered another curious thing about the West, which was called freedom. Uh, the existence of assemblies which were elected with the function of passing laws. Um, an early visitor, an Iranian, but he came from India, who visited England and France at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And one of the places his hosts took him to see was the House of Commons, which he describes at some length. He begins with a rather uncomplimentary description. He says, it reminds him of things we sometimes see in our country trees on opposite sides of the road, all their branches full of parrots squawking at each other. Um, description which is not entirely inept. <laughs> but then he goes on to explain what it's all about. And he says that the English, not having accepted a divine law, as the Muslims have done, are reduced to the expedient of making their own laws. And that is the purpose of this assembly. Now, here I must add a caveat. Um, with this, as with many other writings of the time, one can never be quite sure whether he's being naive or cautious, making his point in a subtle, indirect way, so as not to offend anybody. Um, these are possibilities, obviously, and one has to read very carefully, and it's extremely difficult to pick up subtleties of that kind through, from another civilization and another era. I mention this to indicate the possibility. Anyway, this was seen by many as the, the talisman of Western wealth and power, parliaments. So you get a rash of constitutions and parliaments spreading all over the region. 
The earliest was in Tunisia, followed by one in Turkey, and then in the decades that followed in various other countries. The culmination came with the Russo-Japanese War, when they saw with unspeakable delight the defeat of a European imperial power by an upstart Asian power. The Japanese victory in the Russo-Japanese War sent a wave of hope all across the non-Western world. And there were some who draw, drew a further inference. The defeated European power was the only European power which had rejected any kind of democratic or parliamentary institutions. And the victorious Asian power was the only one that had accepted democratic and parliamentary institutions, QED. The lesson was obvious and it was drawn. And within a few years after that, we have the constitutional revolutions, both in Iran and in Turkey, setting up constitutional and parliamentary regimes, which in both countries proved dismal failures. They just didn't work. They deteriorated into dictatorships. And much the same may be said of the constitutional and democratic regimes, which are set up at various times in other Middle Eastern countries, either by energetic local innovators or else bequeathed to them by departing imperial rulers. And the British and French mandates, for example, in the former Ottoman provinces, they created governments in their own image. The British set up constitutional and parliamentary monarchies. The French established unstable republics. <laughs> Neither group worked particularly well, and most of those have collapsed or been overthrown and given rise to a series of rather shabby dictatorships. So the, the economic formula didn't work. The military formula didn't work. The political constitutional formula didn't work. And meanwhile, the question was becoming more and more agonizing because what went wrong was getting worse and worse. Then there were people, and this begins in Turkey again and spreads elsewhere, during the late 19th century, when they discuss some other possibilities, shall we say, deeper reasons. One is science. In the Middle Ages, I'm using the European term because of its familiarity, not because of its accuracy. Um, in the Middle Ages, the Islamic world was far ahead of anyone else in science. And then gradually they fell behind, further and further behind, as Europe advanced and the Muslim world failed to keep up with the new advances in science. And there were some who said, yes, the reason is that we have fallen behind in the sciences. Why have we fallen behind in the sciences? And that raised a very delicate and difficult question, the question of religion. Obviously, it was not possible, nor indeed was it plausible, to blame Islam for their relative backwardness. It was, after all, under the aegis of Islam that they had achieved their greatest heights, and that at a time when Islam was much nearer to its sources than later. So a new word came into uh, the debate, fanaticism, a word much used in the debate from the late 19th century onwards, meaning, shall we say, the misuse of religion, the distortion of religion, the inappropriate involvement of religion in matters which are not concerns of religion. And you get the growth of a kind of secularism uh, in some Islamic countries. The only one where this really took effect was Turkey. And Turkey was the first Muslim state formally to enact a separation of religion and government. In the constitution of the Turkish Republic, religion has no part in the state and the state has no part in religion. It is separation European style. Elsewhere, this was resisted. Muslims argued, with some reason, that separation of church and state is a Christian remedy for a Christian disease, and therefore not relevant to Muslim concerns. The Turks argued that the Muslims had caught this Christian disease and that a Christian remedy might be worth trying. And that idea is, I think, now also spreading to others but it is still not in itself a sufficient explanation. Another explanation which appeared, and this one I can date with some precision, 1867. There may be earlier occurrences of it, but I am not aware of any. 1867, a Turkish 
writer at the time, a well-known writer at the time called Namak Kemal, wrote an article in which he said, the reason why we have fallen behind the West is the way we treat our women. He said, by subjecting them in the way we do, we deprive ourselves of the talents and energies of half the population. So that our body social, and here he uses a very striking image, he said, our body social compared with like the West is like a human body that is paralyzed on one side. He also uses another striking image when he says, we treat our women at best like jewels or musical instruments. That one grows on you if you think about it. <clears throat> His article had very little impact at the time. There was an Egyptian, Qasim Amin, who also took up the feminist cause and wrote books which were published in Arabic and also translated into Turkish and I believe other languages. And although progress was slow, this issue did become more and more important as time passed on, on both sides. Um, Kemal Atatürk, the founder and first president of the Turkish Republic, was very convinced about this. One of the first things he did after establishing the Republic and becoming its president in 1923 was to go on a tour making speeches demanding political rights for women. Now, anything less likely on the face of it than an Ottoman Pasha and general campaigning for women's rights is difficult to imagine. But he knew what he was doing and he gave his reasons and he said it again and again. He said, our most urgent task now is to catch up with the modern world. We will not catch up with the modern world if we only modernize half the population. Clear, simple, and unlike most clear and simple answers, right rather than wrong. Since then, it has become more and more of an issue, um, particularly, of course, in the Iranian Revolution, where the emancipation of women was one of the principal grievances of Khomeini against the regime of the Shah, um, committing such monstrous violations of tradition as one that he specifically objected to, allowing women teachers to teach adolescent boys in classrooms from which he said only depravity could result. A um, number of other examples, giving votes to women and so on. He disliked the whole lot. And of course the Taliban in Afghanistan take a similar view. This is still very much of an issue. And for many, it is one of the prime differences between the Western and Eastern worlds and therefore deserves at least a close examination for a possible cause. I mentioned a moment earlier, we have a number of travelers. Um, until the beginning of the 19th century, travelers are overwhelmingly Westerners going to the East. The only Easterners going to the West are ambassadors or members of their embassies. After that, there are more of them. Students, and after a while, when they try to adopt democracy, political refugees an inevitable consequence of democratization in countries of autocratic tradition. <clears throat> Both ways, this is one of the things they most noticed. Um, Muslim visitors to the West talk with horror and shock of the absurd deference and dangerous freedom given to women. Um, a Moroccan ambassador in the 17th century in Spain, of all places, talks about the free and easy ways of Spanish women and the lack of manly jealousy of Spanish men. This was in Spain. <laughs> One wonders what he would have thought if he had continued, let us say, to the court of Versailles. <laughs> um, you get the same reaction from uh, Western men visiting the Middle East who note the same distinction and talk with barely concealed envy and what they imagine to be the rights and privileges of a Muslim male. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the funniest that I've come across is uh, in a report from a Turkish ambassador in France around about 186 or 187 and he explains in his report he says that in France when there are public banquets women sit at the table men sit behind them and if the women take pity on the men they throw them some food otherwise they go hungry. I may say that this is not more absurd than some of the Western travelers' descriptions of Eastern life. But I digress. Yes. 
I will. Um, what I've been trying to present is how, well, let me go back a step. When you become aware that something is going wrong, there are two ways you can proceed. You can ask, what did we do wrong? Or the same question, what are they doing right? In which case, the next question is, how do we put it right? There is another way, and that is to look around and say, who did this to us? And that, of course, leads to conspiracy theories and neurotic fantasies and the like. And that when, by that route, things do not get better, and they get worse and worse. And the Middle East, the present day, still faces these two ways of looking at their problems. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a great privilege to be in this place once again. I had the privilege to discover this place in June 1999, when an international conference has been organized here on the frontiers of mind for 20th, 20, 21st century. I could not imagine that time that this conference anticipated on our needs to look back what has happened to all of us historically and to try to understand and to open new possibilities for another history. The frontiers of mind have been traced through history between cultures and civil civilizations so far. And we are living, all of us, with these frontiers corroborated, strengthened, year after year, even in our modern time, through the education, the systems of education, which exist until now in European societies, in American society, in, of course, what we would call today the rest of the world. Because we cannot give a name even now to that world. We speak about Islam. And Islam covers so many cultures, so many societies, so many types of history that it is unacceptable to use that word to point out to such a div diversity. Islam is a constructed concept, constructed by scholarship. Muslim scholarship as well as Western scholarship. And I am the one who has insisted since many years on the urgent necessity to rethink radically what Muslims call Islam. We cannot blame Western scholars to describe Islam as they do, to give to Islam 
a substantialist content fixed forever that no one can change when this would have not been done already by Muslims. I follow totally the questioning of Bernard Lewis about that period of the history, not of Islam, but all societies through the world where Islam as a religion, Islam as a tradition of culture and thinking has become a reference for the people. I speak like this. I do not say Muslim societies. I say even less Muslim society as Ernest Gellner has said in his book. And he is an anthropologist. Muslim society in singular is that construction of the object Islam as a substantive essentialist object which cannot change and which Muslims always are repeating without changing it. And all the reactions which have been described by Bernard Lewis after 13th century, 14th century are historically true. And we have to ask what has happened after 13th, 14th century in that part of the world which we have to consider and reconsider as the Mediterranean space where several cultures, several traditions of thinking and tradi religious traditions have emerged, have struggled, have developed wars and wars, and we have to look at that area in a global way and also to describe in the same time the role played by Islam when Islam quotation marks when this Islam became a historical force became an empire with the Umayyad empire with the Abbasid empire etc and the, the Ottoman empire but in the same time after 13th century we have to describe parallelly and correlatively what we call Europe and then what we call the West. We have to make a strict distinction between Europe and the West for obvious historical reasons. The West, which we are using on the side, you see, I, we need another vocabulary. How to name that side of Mediterranean area, south and east of Mediterranean area? I do not want to name it Islam. We cannot name it Arab. It is the Irano -Tur Turk. No, I'm speaking French, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how do you say Irano Turco Arabic space? Yes. And on the other side, European space, since the emergence of that Islam in the beginning of 7th century. And the history of that, of these, of this region, Europe, and let's, let's say Islam, this history has to be rewritten, especially after 13th century, in considering what has happened in Europe and what has happened in that, that other part of the world and explain the correlative evolution of Europe towards an hegemony 
to replace the hegemony of Islam before on that Mediterranean area, because Islam also, also had its hegemony, and how this hegemony has grown up through the centuries and determined parallelly the weaknessing, the process of marginalization in the Mediterranean area of all these societies which we know also today as the Iran society, Turkish society, and Arab societies, North African societies. Bernard Lewis, in his book, looks only on the side of Muslim societies. He, he says it. He has no difficulty to say it. Me, I have, a, as you see, a lot of difficulties for many reasons. But he, he is not speaking at all on what has happened from the side of Europe in the same time. It was a struggle for hegemony. 1492 is a date which tells us a lot about one event which is, has been uh, celebrated in all Europe in, uh, in uh, 1992, the discovery of America. And the other event in the same year was the end of Muslim presence in Andalus by the will of the Catholic, uh, Catholic Church in, in Spain after all the process of the Reconquista in Spain and the rest of Europe. This is a date which is extremely important and since that date we have to look to history in a dialectic way. There are always tensions between the Ottoman Empire and, the, and Europe, and these tensions were more and more unequal, unbalanced, because it is true. On the side of Islam, <laughs> on the side of Islam, what has happened? I raise the same question, but I give another answer, other answers. What do we have to do to understand that history and to understand even more what has happened after another date, which is extremely important, to try to find not only explanations to this event of September, which, in my vision, should become an advent. The, the event should become an advent with, of course, many conditions. I shall try to give you uh, an overview of these conditions that we have to fulfill as actors, all of us, of the present history. I cannot repeat always from the side of Islam who did this to us, why it happened to why this is happening to us. This is a rhetoric question. This is a question which doesn't open all the files that we have to open about the history of the Mediterranean area, as I told you. Let's consider some of the text which Bernard Lewis has used in his book. He says, if the peoples of the, Mid of, of the Middle East continue on their present path, the suicide bomber may become a metaphor for the whole region, and there will be no escape from a downward spiral of hate and spite, rage and self-pity, poverty and oppression, culminating sooner or later in yet another alien domination. Perhaps from a new Europe reverting to, to old days, perhaps from a resurgent Russia, perhaps from new expanding superpower in the East, for the time being, the choice 
is their own. I don't know how you receive this paragraph written by Bernard Lewis. It is not possible and not fair for a historian to say that the present people of Mediterranean area of whom he is speaking have really the choice, have the freedom to produce their own history. The people, these people of whom we are speaking lost the freedom, lost the possibility to produce their history as France, according to a saying of the historian Michelet, he said, la France a fait la France par un lent travail de soi sur soi. Help me please to translate it into a good English. That's why I couldn't give the translation in English. It, the, the, the meaning is that France has produced its own history through the work of, of the self on the self, if it is correct to say that, like this. Which means that no external force intervened in France to force France to choose that direction or that other direction in producing his history. In the case of the people we are speaking about, about these people have lost their possibility precisely as you have indicated in your book since at least the treaty of Karlovitz to which you, you have uh, uh, alluded in, in your book. Which means since 1699, the end of 17th century, the hegemony of Europe has been established in the area and the hegemony here means the impossibility to exercise any kind of political sovereignty. And this will become worse after 18th, because 18th is the beginning of colonization, the, this page of colonization that we have to reread, to rewrite historically. We, still, we are still awaiting historians to write that page of history, not in opposing only modernity and modernization, which is on the side of, European, of Europe and America, of course, and on the other side, a continuous decay. Muslims asking always, what do we have to do? What we did that we are so, so uh, backwarded, so uh, weak, etc., etc. This is a history which has not been written. I can tell you this, especially as an Algerian, the history, for example, between France and Algeria, until now, you can follow in the newspapers the debates about this. We are trying to open that page of history, to write it correctly with an objective approach and the tools of historians, not only with what we call the uh, histoire événementielle, uh, uh, I cannot translate. Uh, uh, yes, uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, histoire uh, événementielle, uh, by the way, uh, I apologize to my friend. The way he presents all this history, especially in this book, is totally in the frame of what we call histoire événementielle. He is con considering events and using these events to try to explain something which is much more important than these events would mean, because these events are totally forgotten. They are not even taught. Uh, the people now, the, the young generation, are not studying that part of history. When they study in Arabic, world, for example, the history of the Ottoman Empire, they just say that the Ottoman Empire has been very bad to Arabic culture, etc. And so this is an approach which cannot be be uh, satisfying for us. Unfortunately, I have no time to, 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 to elaborate what I would like to say about what has happened after 1945. Here is another date. 
there is a, a before and an after 1945. Why is that? After the Second World War. By the way, we have to ask, what went wrong in Europe that we had such a war? <laughs> what? what went wrong? What went wrong for a reason of enlightenment, which enlightened the whole world? What went wrong with that modernity, which taught us so magnificent lessons? And we had such a war that I don't need to describe. Here is a subject which, again, historians have not yet approached in the perspective of the history of Mediterranean area. I come back to that. That history is not written in spite of all the works done by many scholars, good scholars, but a scholar is a scholar. He is always limited. <laughs> Whatever I ah, yes, I know that. We are all limited. We cannot do more than life can allow us to do. After the Second World War, we had wars between European countries, especially Britain and France, with their colonies in the 50s, which means that the mentality of colonial domination was still existing in Europe in the 50s. Read the newspapers in England, in France, in Spain, during the 50s, even more. Read the newspapers of today. I heard by Bernard Lewis before we came here that a, 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 an Italian journalist has written a book uh, entitled The Rage and the Pride about Arabs. This book has sold more than one million copies. And the book of our friend here has sold, he told me, has sold more than 100,000 copies. It is published only since two days. This is a phenomenon that we have to consider. It is the phenomenon of the social imaginary of the West about the way the West is perceiving all the reality related to Islam, the big Islam, the constructed Islam, which is guilty of all the sins of the present world, and also Arabs who are invading Europe, etc., etc. Even now, it is not finished. That's why we have to ask what went wrong, not in Islam only, in Muslim societies only, what went wrong with human mind? What went wrong with the thinking we are producing and what is still wrong in the way we are practicing social sciences and political sciences even more? Because political sciences are, as you know, focusing on fundamentalist Islam, looking to fundamentalist Islam in the short period, rejecting, ignoring totally what Fernand Brodel has described as the long-term perspective in history. We need the long-term perspective in history to explain totally what has happened. And this long-term perspective, for example, would allow us to tell that Islam as a religion emerged in the beginning of the 7th century as a spiritual subversion of the existing uh, 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 theologies and religion in, in Christianity and Judaism. The Quran is challenging theologically the, the, the existing theologies of Christianity. This is an intellectual, spiritual subversion. It's not a political subversion. Uh, just as Jesus of Nazareth, a Jew, spoke from inside the, the temple to subvert the ritualist Jewish religion as it was pra practiced in, the, in, this in his time and to open new 
horizons for spirituality and for religion. This event, of course, became a political event, became a, a, a historical force, and we have to uh, study its development, but not forget the spiritual function and the spiritual subversion of the text of the Quran itself. But this, I'm not accusing at all Western scholars about this. The responsibility is Muslims. It is Muslims that they who have not until today developed what I tried to do personally since the 80s. I tried to subvert intellectually, spiritually, what I call Islamic reason. This is another work. This is another responsibility. This is thinking history with intellectual responsibility. Not reducing history to just a number of successive events to which we give the importance that they cannot have, in fact. How to, and the other, the other book which I have just published go fur, goes further than the first one about the critique of Islamic peace. It is the unthought in contemporary Islamic thought. We cannot, on the side of Islam, remain always repeating what the ancient thinkers, the ancient theologians ha have taught. We have the right to start again a totally new reading of what is called the holy text itself. And what I am doing is to reread the text of the Quran and to say that there is no point to ask to the Quran to give an answer whether we have to do, we are allowed to do this or not allowed to do that. This is a mentality uh, uh, constructed by theology since the medieval ages, not only for Muslims, but it is the same for Christians, it is the same for Judaism. That's why we have to subvert the three systems of theology. The Christian system of theology, the Jewish system of theology, and the Muslim system of theology. We have to stop thinking, focusing only on the case of Islam. That only Islam thing went wrong, wrong for, for, for him and he has to catch up and, uh, to, uh, and to be modern and to modernize itself, etc. This is a wrong approach. We cannot do any good with such an approach. But you, you all feel that we are entrapped in this way of thinking, putting Islam aside and putting what we call this, the West aside. This project of intellectual and spiritual subversion is the only one which will allow us to introduce in all our societies another system of education. The teaching of religion has been eliminated in many societies, not here, in Europe, in the name of what we call secularism, and especially in, Fran in, in, in France, what we call laïcité. The result of this decision is that we are illiterate illiterate in terms of knowing what religion is.